So this is the first chance I've actually got to speak to you one-on-one. -on -one. So I'm really excited about that today. I just wanted to start out with how I found your work and what sort of drew me to it. Um, so I'm, I'm always thinking about how works exist in the physical world, even if it's digital. And so when, when I saw your work, I, I was thinking about more than just the image. You know, I was thinking about an older TV and how that would look in a contemporary setting with your work playing on it. And, and so there's this interplay with time and, and the feelings of nostalgia, the confusion of like, you know, the, the past, the present and the future sort of crossing over and mixing realms. Um, that really drew me to your art. And um, so, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's as, a, as a someone that collects physical art, looking at digital art, I was always thinking about like how it would fit in my space, you know? There's a painting right there, there's a sculpture, and then how do I display this? How, how would this sort of give me that, that feeling when I see it? And so, so there's a sense of place that happens when you when you take your, your your work and bring it into that physical realm. Um, but before I get a little bit into that, would you like to um, introduce yourself and tell us a little about your art? Sure. <laughs> uh, hi, I'm Sarah Zucker. I'm an artist who is working with the interplay of cutting edge and obsolete technologies uh, in an increasingly delightfully mixed sort of way. Um, you know, the reason I think I use these vintage technologies is it's it's really a way of me reflecting on this sort of exciting and unusual experience I've gotten to have in my lifetime of like being right at the parabola of technology, like the number of mediums that I have experienced in my lifetime alone and the good fortune to have been positioned right in a way where I still also get to be digitally native. Um, I think that's that's um, a huge part of my art. It's like reflecting on this, this bridge, the spirit bridge, I call it, between the analog and the digital. And so I find this, uh, you know, inviting in these looks of the very recent past, these aesthetics of the recent past and these tools of the recent past are a way really to reflect on how much things are changing and how much things are going to continually psychedelically change for the rest of our lifetimes. You know, things are going to just at this point exponentiate into infinity. And we as these like, you know, little flesh bags kind of have to have to figure that out and so uh, I'd say my work uses a lot of mysticism it uses psychedelia it it uses a lot of humor because I think uh humor is actually maybe one of the most powerful tools we have available to us in times that are incredibly challenging for us and incredibly difficult to wrap our minds around I think that humor um humor doesn't get enough credit for for what it can do for us yeah i feel that that is something that i i look for and i don't see a lot of and so when i find you know an artist who's able to communicate like really well with that i'm, I'm drawn to it um so what i think of is like when when i'm when i'm thinking of your work okay i i i have a lot of good memories you know growing up but most of them are from movies you know i i, I was I grew up like in a really strict household. I didn't get to go out a lot. And so I was watching TV and, you know, like videos. All my good memories are like someone else's Christmas or like, you know, um, a character on TV sort of going through this like triumph. And and I think that I get like, I, I get taken to that spot um, when I see your work. So there's a lot of good feelings that come up just from seeing it. And I'm just curious, like, how, how, you, how would you like the viewers to react to your work? It's tricky because it's, it, part of me doesn't want to be prescriptive at all. I think as an artist, my role really is to convey my message as potently as I can and then allow the interpretation to develop. Uh, you know, I think that's actually sort of the ongoing 
collaboration between the artist and the viewer uh, that, that I'm often sort of um, delighted by ways people interpret my work, things they find in it that I realize maybe I did subconsciously intend, yeah. but not, but I did not uh, consciously place in there. And so it's, it's honestly, I think, one of the most beautiful things between the relationship between the artist and the viewer or the artist and the collector, because obviously what compels someone to collect a work is an even stronger uh, feeling than sort of passively viewing a work. Um, and, and it's been this really beautiful dialogue between me and my collectors and my viewers. Um, but everything you've said about um, this notion of nostalgia, this notion of the experience of viewing videos. I mean, that's that's where it comes from for me. And that's what I think was the impetus to begin working with the tools I work with was actually like acquiring the camcorder that my family used like for for like home videos growing up for years. I like schemed to get my hands on this thing. My parents were always like, no, this is an expensive piece of technology. We're not going to let you six year old play with it, you know. Um, but I was like constantly like these Bugs Bunny-esque schemes, of, like how I could get my hands on this camcorder. And it was around 2009, I actually began converting all our old home videos to digital. So we'd have them digitized. And I think that in a lot of ways, that was around the time I really, I had been a photographer uh, really for almost a decade at that point. Photography was my original medium, like still photography. And I think it was that, that process of digitizing all these home videos that kind of like exploded the fourth dimension for me and exploded this sense of reflecting back on my own young life, you know, and seeing how much already had, had changed in technology, seeing how much it already um, created this feedback loop that, that we, you know, that the people of my sort of age cohort we kind of had this unusual first experience of having the feedback loop of being able to see our own childhoods on video. So documented and, and, and that sense of like, do the memories I have, are they memories or are they memories of viewing a, an experience on tape and like how sort of like trippy and identity shaking that is that you're like I actually don't know how much of my life and my memory is my own memory or is me witnessing a recording of something that happened to me that I don't really remember or is it something I saw on tv that I've somehow assimilated yeah. into my memory and I'm forgetting because I had such an emotional experience with it at a point in my life I'm forgetting that didn't happen to me that happened to someone on tv and so I think, you know, I work in a number of different styles sort of under this banner of what I do working with, with vintage technology. But I think they're all in a way getting at this, this sense of exploding time itself as we sit here on the parabola shift of technology. And um, it's very inspired. I was very, very into the writer Kurt Vonnegut as like a teenager. And he has this concept about this alien race, the Trafalmadorians, who don't, they don't view time the way we view time. We as humans view time like pearls on a strand. It's like one moment, then the next moment, then the next moment. The Trafalmadorians view time, they're able to see in four dimensions. Like we see in three dimensions. They see in four dimensions, meaning they can see time like a mountain range. So they can look at it and see all of time at once. And if they want, they can focus in on each individual moment and see its definition but they also have this like this different scope of it and I think that that concept really really stuck with me when I when I sort of like started chewing on it as a teenager and it's what I really aim to channel in my work is is the point is not necessarily for it to be retro or to be nostalgic it's more about using nostalgia as a Trojan horse. It's using nostalgia as a way to open the viewer up, you know, that people see it, they go, oh, that reminds me of my childhood or that reminds me of good times in the past. And they feel warm, they feel open to it. And then it's actually a way for me to then kind of get in some of these mystical questions I grapple with, uh, existential questions I grapple with, 
thoughts about where I think the future is going, problems I see arising as the future is kind of upon us. Um, so I really view it as a way of looking back to look forward. And in doing that process of looking back to look forward, I think it's always then art that's very much about now. It's always very much about taking us out of time in order to have a different perspective on time. And I think what's interesting is when you brought up the point that when you're watching a memory of yourself, you know, like on VHS, it's it's the camera's memory. You know, like it's through the camera's eyes. And so there's also this relationship with what took the video and then the person viewing it is also like standing from the vantage point of the camera, you know, and experiencing that sort of like transportational effect in the memory. Um, and I, like when you, when you talk about, you know, seeing this feedback, I'm getting a sense that like it was this playful thing. And so you you brought that with you now where you're you're mixing for these analog techniques and uh, with the VHS and and digital. Can you talk a little about that process um, you know, without going into, you know, too much detail, but I just sort of I'm I'm picturing, I'm trying to imagine like what this is like because it seems so playful to me. Play is an essential part of my practice, if not the foundational aspect of my practice. Um because my work really is using this technology from my childhood, I think um, my inner child is really the captain when it when it comes to making the art. You know, the the adult self comes in when it's time to present the art, speak about the art, package the art, release the art. You know, there is an adult uh, in the room, so to speak. But when it comes to creating, I think yes, I'm I'm very much intentionally taking up tools that remind me of my childhood um, because it, it allows me to be um, mischievous. I think mischief is, is such a huge part of what I do. And, and what I mean by that is that even the way I'm using these tools, I am not using them the way they were intended to be used. I am, uh, you know, I have certain tools in my kit, um, I really, I call my system my my analog video rig. Uh, and I actually also refer to it as my video altar because I often feel yeah. like sort of a witch or a wizard at an altar, like crafting alchemy. And, um, you know, there are a number of components to this, this rig I've built out over the years, um, including devices that were like originally for home video editors to, you know, like adjust the color on their on their home video. And I have, you know, tools from from different uh, makers who've like modified them to create like glitch, glitch effects, right? That's some of what I use. And then again, I use this camcorder that's like my family's camcorder. And I've built a, syst a feedback system that lets me, you know, feed into a TV that I'm then recording. I would say that video feedback, which is, that's essentially what it is, is recording, recording the feed you're recording um, mm -hmm. is is such a huge part of what I do. And it's something that anyone who's ever pointed a camera at a TV uh, receiving that feed knows that it can be incredibly chaotic and incredibly almost like terrifying because it can, you know, same as like standing in front of a speaker with the microphone, it, it can like deafen you, right? Like feedback loops by definition are, are fairly chaotic typically. So I think a huge part of my craft is actually that I have found different ways of taming feedback and different ways of like, I almost call myself like a video cowboy. Like it's like riding a bucking Bronco to work with video feedback and to get it to loop. I think that's, that's a place where I, I have a uh, great pride in, in these sort of techniques I've developed um, where it's very difficult to get a clean loop with, with something as chaotic as video feedback. And um yeah, and just other, just like old broadcast devices I've brought in and I'm making them do things that like, that is not what the people who developed these devices wanted them to do. So there is this inherent act of mischief in being this person in the 2020s using these old devices and 
And it's almost like a spaceship. Like I'm taking myself into outer space with them, you know? And that even to say it like that, it's like, there is that degree of like being a child, being mm, able to tap into that sense of make-believe as an adult person uh, becomes difficult over the years. It's it's something that I've I've really actively cultivated as a way to create visions that not only inspire joy in people, but but do um, have those layers of meaning and have layers of that sense that I think we can all relate to of what it what it was to be a child playing make believe and having anything be possible. Something that makes your work unique to me is like how powerfully I'm able to access memories and experiences and feelings. Because you know you, you're you're looking at art through a screen, right? And and on some of these platforms, it's just like, okay, let's click on that, look at that, look at that. And I was really going through a lot of art at the time. It wasn't it wasn't as much as it is now. Uh, it was it was manageable, and so I could spend the whole day sort of looking through Sakura and looking at different artists. And I just thirsted for that feeling that I get when I go to like an art fair and, you know, I've seen these artists work on Instagram before, but not like in person. And I see a piece and it just hits me. Like I feel it. Like I need that extra little bump to be like, okay, I want to bring this into my life. Cause I could collect, you know, whatever. There's so many artists that I think that are like fabulous and, 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 and are wonderful, but I try and collect the ones that I connect with because it's my story now. You know, like every work that I have is part of my story that I'm able to share with people. And then I'm sort of able to um, talk about the work in a way that's, you know, passionate as opposed to like um, academic. So like, can we talk a little about the gift wait, oh, wait you mentioned the loop that i think i think that's an interesting point too because looking through works and 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 the loop is really is really important and it's underrated i mean i i've been familiar with you know media works um and some of them were like a little bit longer you know let's say like four minutes or whatever and and with digital art like going to super rare noticing these loops was a bit of a transition for me you know to say i'm looking at this okay it's four seconds and it repeats itself you know but it really forced me to start looking you know you have something in motion so you tend to sort of like view the totality of it right but there's a sense of um now and presence when you're sitting in front of a loop and you're watching it over and over, it sort of allows time to stop in a way for you to take in that information. So, so I know that you have um, a ton of views on your, your GIF art, right? Now, can you talk a little about that and you know what your most popular GIF was? I mean, I, I, I'm so interested um, by GIF as a means of communication because we see it a lot on Twitter, you know, as responses, we see it a lot in Discord. Like I personally respond to a lot of things, but just like a gift because it communicates possibly better than text, you know, because it's just more like of a pure feeling that you get from it. Um, so yeah, I'd love to hear a little about the, uh, your, your gifts and, and how that is related to your, your art and NFT. Gifts are, I think, uh, you know, probably one of the most potent forms of visual communication of all time, but certainly one of the most defining forms of visual communication of our times. Um, and, and it's interesting, you know, not all gifts have to loop, not all digital art has to loop. I'm very much of the, of the stance that uh, there might be guidelines, but there really are no rules about what anything needs to be. Um, but what I will say for artwork that loops, and I would say, uh, you know, the vast, certainly the vast majority of my own artwork uh, is designed to loop seamlessly, is 
exactly that thing of in in looping seamlessly an artwork no longer has a duration the duration becomes infinite uh which is a bear of a thing to try to explain when you're trying to submit things to like film festivals <laughs> like, the duration is technically three seconds but it's also forever um and i think that's what excites me about working with loops and again because I use so much video feedback in my work uh, I'm also excited about loops like mine where you really don't know where it begins and, and ends it's 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 changed again the very notion of timing and duration itself uh, into something that is you know it moves and you know it's there's a rhythm typically to a loop but the beginning and the end, it's a snake that eats its own tail. It's its infinite. It's a Mobius strip. And so what excites me about GIFs and why I think I've worked so much in the format of GIF is it fits into this sort of ethos of combining the sacred and the profane. Like GIFs are at once something that that is ephemera. It's It's internet garbage in a lot of ways. It's like, you know, it's just... Uh, that which sort of litters this this virtual space we've been occupying, you know, since 1987, gifts were were invented. Um, so it's like it's very easy to toss it aside as that. And I think in a lot of ways, in a lot of contexts, the context that's how people speak about gifts. That they're sort of just these like, you know, internet flyers, garbage things. Um, but they also, you know, for those of us who who really formed art practices around GIF as like one of our central formats. GIFs, much like NFTs themselves, it's simply a container. It's a blank container for an artist to make whatever they will of it. And so I also think GIF, because it's so simple, allows for just like some of the greatest art of our time takes the form of an animated GIF. And, um, yeah, it's really something where I get delighted by anything that can that can straddle the sacred and profane in that way. That can somehow be so nothing and also be so everything. Because I think that that is like the defining emotional experience of the internet itself. Of like, we're on Twitter, we're saying stupid shit, we're doing whatever. You know, like it doesn't feel important in a lot of ways. It feels quotidian it feels very like silly and and it is it can be quite ribald you know like it can be quite um ridiculous but then you I don't know can sometimes get this scope of this flash of this moment of hundreds of years from now people will be studying the stupid shit we post on Twitter <laughs> like it's also like it is the texture of how human beings are not only living our lives, but how we are attempting an evolutionary shift into being virtual entities. We are disembodying ourselves. That's what the internet is. And gifts are the way we are expressing physicality and, and visual language in a non-physical way. I mean, that's, that's, again, it's like for as silly as they are, you know, it might be a minion pooping or something, but like, it also is a way that we are conveying human experience in this new virtual landscape that we have the exciting opportunity to define and develop. Like, I have a piece called Ancient Future that, that really is about this, this notion that like, we are the ancients of a future civilization, like we are antiquity of what internet future will be and so um yeah i think that gif it's it's simple but it it allows for artists to communicate infinitely and i think that that's that's a very exciting thing and i think it's why as a format it has entrenched itself because we're like leaving so much information behind you know it's like with twitter you 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 have like this record of conversations that are happening that, you know, like if you were to just pass by it or open it up and read, you'd be like, what is going on? This is craziness. This is, this is life. You know, this is what it is. Like, this is what people are discussing. This is how they treat each other. And it may have changed a little because it's like now we're behind a computer. We sort of like are safer in a way to be a little bit more edgy or 
you know, because you see a lot of people getting into arguments and it, it doesn't feel like it's like a perfect representation of humanity, but it's still how we're going to be recorded and, and people are going to, to have access to this information because hopefully we are good at, you know, sort of keeping it alive um, for the ages. But, but that, that's, that's, that's really interesting about like the, the loop being sort of this infinite loop. It's, it's so true because a good loop doesn't have a start or beginning. It's just, off. it's just there. And it's very, it's very effective at, you know, grabbing someone's attention and focus and allowing them to really see the work. Um, now, are there any sort of misconceptions that you receive being a digital artist that um, mints the work of NFTs? There are quite a few misconceptions about what it is to be a digital artist and specifically what it is to be a digital artist working with NFTs. I think the biggest misconception I face around NFTs is the fact that there's still such nascent understanding of them or maybe non-understanding of them is that NFTs get made out by sort of different factions of people to be both a lot more than what they are and also missing sort of the actual point of what they are. Uh, and what I mean by that is that like NFTs are not the second coming of the Messiah. They are not, it's not um, that kind of like a spiritual revelation, which is how some speak of them. And I think that that maybe throws others off when they're trying to wrap their heads around what they are. But similarly, they're also not the Antichrist. They're also not like the end of the world. They don't signify the end of art and the end of all things good. I think people uh, right now, we all have a, a an apocalyptic tendency in our thinking. And so what I like to point out to people about NFTs is that they are just simply and in a revolutionary way, a blank container for any sort of digital content or just intellectual content, just virtual content of any sort, non-physical human creation, right? And as such, they are a one-to-one -one analog to the idea of a print or a casting or any other form of edition we have in art. We're the only place where that that analog sort of becomes confused is that in the case of digital art, there's no original, typically. You know, d if digital art is truly digital, the original is a file, which is infinitely reproducible, which is where the notion of a single edition comes in. If you only ever are going to create one NFT edition of that artwork, that then is the original because it's the sole and only edition on the blockchain. It's the artist is saying, I intend this as an original. I intend this as a single creation. There will be no others. Um, and, and this is the kind of thing I kind of love quibbling about and, and getting into the uh, granular detail of with other artists, because th that's my take on it. Um, and others disagree with me. But I think that that, that view of it allows people to grok what we're talking about here. If you are looking to collect an NFT and there, it's an edition of 20, it's the same as if you collected a print from an artist that's an edition of 20. Uh, if you collect the one of one, it's the same as though you went and they sold you the original sculpture or you know the original painting. Um, I would say as a whole, as, as artists working in the digital realm, um, it's not new, but there has for a long time been a lot of pushback against digital artists and artists working with computers. Um, I myself have experienced it in my own life. I was very dissuaded by an art teacher when I was young who, who said that art made by a computer is by the computer. It's not by the artist. And I, I sort of, as a 10 year old was like, I, I disagree. <laughs> like the computer wouldn't. The computer is just a tool and like any other tool, just like a paintbrush, just like, you know, uh, a camera, 
it's a tool and um, it's something I often like to chew on that as our tools become more robust, as AI gets stronger and stronger and stronger, it's not to say any any tool is invalid. All tools are valid. It's just a personal belief that art should show the voice of an artist more than anything else. Because if what you see in the art is the tool more than the artist, then it's just a demonstration of what the tools can do. And the stronger the tool, the stronger the artist must be, the stronger the artist's voice must be. And so, yeah, it's, it's, it's been a, it's been fascinating these past few years, seeing these sort of old arguments get stirred up again. Now that digital artists, digitally native artists have this means of editioning our artwork in its native format. That's what we're doing here. We're simply editioning our artwork the same any other artist would edition their artwork. Um, but I think it's it's upsetting people because it's it's striking at the heart of not only what is art, it's striking at the heart of like what has value and what is the importance of physicality in value? What is the importance of there being an original physical object? behind what we what we give value to uh and it's it extends beyond art it's it's no surprise that i think artists are kind of leading the fray into this question but this is a question underlying society itself it's a question underlying the idea that like currency itself has to be backed by something physical but we're even beginning to question that you know as as our lived lives become more and more virtual it, it sort of stands to reason that art is becoming more and more virtual, that we're reflecting the way that we're living. And so it's, um, it's, it's unfortunate, certainly unfortunate that there, there's a lot of like aggression and uh, even what I would call um, violence that masquerades as activism towards artists uh, who work with digital tools uh, because I think it just brings up fear in people and it, it brings up this knee jerk reaction they have to say that's not art that's not valid because it does not fit into this framework of what we historically understand to be art and yet as someone who works primarily in the digital realm I'd be the first to say my practice doesn't look that different from the practice of a painter you know, I still, as a human being, have to occupy physical space. I have to ideate and sketch and and do all these same things in order to engender my work. It just ends up manifesting in this way that is is completely virtual, even in its original form. And um, yeah, it's I it it's one of those things I think that. It's not to say you either get it or you don't. It's just to say people get it when they get it. And if they don't get it, you just kind of can't explain it. You either see how it is legitimate, how it is a legitimate organic expression from a from a person who has a gift or has has a remarkable ability or or you just don't see that. <laughs> and as artists, it's sort of uh, you know, we have art to make. It's 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 like we can only spend so much time trying to um, insist to people that what we are creating has validity. I think it's it's a matter of time. I think people need to become more comfortable with it. There's like maybe this sense that it's been like pushed upon them because in the news had like such a media storm about them. And so they're like, why are you trying to get me to buy all this digital art? And he's like, no, and always it's just like the TV is saying that, you know, but there's it's not just that, it's it's a bunch of different artists. And yeah, sure, some of them may think one way, but I think there are a lot of real artists here, and I've gotten a chance to to speak to them and develop relationships with them just because of the way that the sort of like NFT space, the communication in it being sort of on Twitter and being able to message someone and have those conversations and even phone calls. And maybe, you know, you go to NFT NYC and you meet them. And so there was there's this really great sense of of um, camaraderie that I got 
because we're all going through this experience, you know, during the lockdown, but we're connected through the computer and building those connections was so interesting because they were real and they were strong. And even when I was like working on a show in Decentraland, okay, like way back, this is the first time we were experimenting with it. And I did it with an artist and we hadn't met each other in person, but we were just like meeting each other in Decentraland and talking through the push to talk. And it was just like, we're here, what's up? We're friends, we're, you know, we're close friends now, let's build this. And having that sort of like shift and realizing, wow, the digital is, is really powerful. There are experiences to be had here. And so I just jump, I jump right in, you know, from Decentraland into like first going in super rare and looking at stuff, you know, one by one. And I even started like, my Twitter was, began because I wanted to sort of like bookmark stuff and, and I would repost it just to have a memory of like the stuff that I liked and keep track of it. And I didn't buy anything for a while. I just sort of watched. And then I was like, you know, I should probably get one thing because I'm here, I'm experiencing this, this is exciting. You know, and ETH was going up. And I was like, I have a little. And so I got I got a work by pack. And um that really helped me understand also the the NFT and sort of like the performance that he was sort of having on Twitter by every bid that would happen you know you would mention it and you would create this sort of like competitiveness between you and the the other bidder and um that was that that's something that's all being recorded like every bid that happens on it is a part of the blockchain and so you become a part of that story even if you don't win that piece you know i mean if you don't like if that's not a part of your collection you still have made a mark because you were trying to get it and maybe you couldn't quite win the auction um but there's there's just so many interesting things that happen when you when you uh, mint an artwork on the blockchain that you'd be wild not to to be excited by it. Now going back to the typography, you, can you talk about how you play with that in your work? I play so I play with typography in a sort of ongoing series that I call Video Thoughts. Um, which for me really come out of the fact that I'm I'm a writer. I mean, I'm I'm multidisciplinary artist, and I, my entire education was actually in writing and not in art. And I really like working with text in this way that um, it you know it is it is about typography. Uh, I I I, would, I do not design my own fonts. Um, but I do think that there is something to be said for having that uh, ability to grasp the emotional tone of letter shapes and and different fonts and different ways you express things. Um, you know, in, they emit a different sort of tone to them. It's almost like a synesthetic thing. And... Um, I really see video thoughts as a form of like a synesthetic artwork, meaning that they sort of overlap different sensory experience, that they are thoughts. There is an intellectual side to them where they are these, um, these thoughts I have, these sort of like that exist as their own little monoliths, but I'm playing with I'm playing again with the notion of the loop and the notion of the feedback loop and how feedback loops don't only exist visually, they exist logically. Like a lot of contemporary logic and philosophy is oriented around the concept of the feedback loop. Um, like a lot of like cybernetics, which kind of gave, gave rise to postmodernism and gave rise to really everything we're doing now is about the ways in which the individual is informed by the society and the society is informed by the individual. And those two things are in constant like feedback loop with each other. And so it's a heady way to put it, but, but it's really what I mean by that is like these statements I'm creating in these like almost image macros, uh, these, these, these text images are intended to have an almost mantra like quality in that way because they loop because there is movement paired with them that is 
intended to evoke the thought itself, like the motion and the thought communicate. And, and, and I do find that they have a certain meditative quality in that way, that they are just these little crystals of thought that, that can be as fractal or as simple as the viewer is capable and willing to experience them. I think for me, um, what I personally love about that series and about that form of expression for myself is that it satisfies um, this sort of like ideal of art making that I've long held dear. And it's not to say I always make art in this way, but it's a certain ideal I have about art that I think art that is the most magnificent and the most likely to stand the test of time is art that can be understood by a child and an adult and that they can both get something impactful from it and that that impact in fact over time can actually grow. Um, when I think of my own favorite artists like Henri Matisse is one of my favorite artists. I, I just was so drawn to his work as a young child and it's it's so colorful and it's so like the shapes and the dynamism of it is something that a five-year-old can look at and go i love it i love it i know i i get it i love it but then as you get older and as you develop more language and understanding and emotional texture to your own inner world you can return to those works and you you don't look at them and go oh they seem childish to me now you see them and you go, I am getting new things from this. I am getting new layers that that are like, I can only now taste because I'm at like the age that I am and I've had the experiences I've had. And those were in there all along. And that's such an exciting, I like have goosebumps talking about it because it's like the most exciting, ecstatic experience that art can do for us. And, and I, you know, uh, I'd like to say that's what I aspire to with those works. I, whether or not I'm always um, successful, again, that's for the viewer to decide. That's really not for me to prescribe to people um, if they get that experience from them. But I do think that that is what those works as sort of like language statements, um, language statements that contain other hidden meanings inside them I think they are they are designed to blossom. And also, I wanted to go into some of the colors that you use because that's something that I was very drawn to in your work. It's this sort of electric palette, but distinct and the colors like just pull me in because they convey a lot of energy. Yes, it's absolutely electric. It is something I've actually in recent works I've been making, recent abstract works. I've really been playing with the notion of electric color itself and the notion of um, how the cathode ray tube of televisions, which the, the televisions I use to create my art are all cathode ray tube televisions, which none of us have you get new anymore. They're, those are the big, the big heavy glass TVs, you know, um, but of a time, that's what all TVs were. And if you've ever gotten up, really close to them, you see how it's the RGB. It's the, the cathodes are the little, you know, color dots. And um, that I am able to, because I think I, I really have gotten very granular about it and have really developed certain techniques um, that while they've been informed by by knowledge I've, I've received and, and uh, you know, learned, those colors have only been arrived at through the years of experience of me and my alchemy and and notes I've taken for myself and recipes I've created of how I get those specific palettes. And uh, the palettes are not fixed either. As I've, as I, you know, I always say that my art is incredibly unlikely because I'm working with gear that's actively obsolescing. I'm working with gear that's actively dying on me, um, which I guess you could say any any artist is doing that because we're all actually, um, as artists, we're actively dying. But um, <laughs> all humans are. But the gear, but there's a certain poetry in that. I'm working with this gear, much of which has been discarded, has been left behind as 
no longer valid or no longer, uh, you know, useful. And I'm pushing it and I'm getting these things out of it and the, the glorious glow of its like dying breath, you know, before these things do inevitably sometimes die on me and I have to replace them. And especially when you're getting gear from eBay or from odd places like that, the exact same device, I'll plug it in. It's the exact same model. And I'll go, it's the colors are all completely different now because this is, this device is as old as I am. And it's, you know, it's lived a life and it's, um, so it's all to say that I think my palette is very distinct and very recognizable, but it is also dynamic and shifting always. Um, but it's, it's that, I think a lot of what I'm doing with like my color stories, very actively, I'm engaging with the narrative of how color itself and our perception of color itself was dramatically shifted in the 20th century, dramatically shifted by the advent of electric light, which, you know, predates the 20th century, but really came into play with like the invention of the neon light, the invention of the cathode ray tube television and that RGB color space that any of us working with digital art, we know because we're all working in RGB color space. That's what you're seeing on your screens is RGB color space and and using those three colors and blending them in ways, uh, you know, to create this whole other palette, this whole other spectrum of colors that uh, anyone who's ever tried to print something, print is CMYK. It's a di it's a different color space and. And that translation and that dance you have to do, I think actually really makes you reflect on like how special RGB color space is, how luminant it is, because it is derived from the advent of electricity itself. It is electric. Like I, I, this was something puzzling me about a year ago when I realized how much like fluorescent color I use in my work. And I thought, right, again, this is my dialogue with my own childhood that fluorescent neon colors were so huge when I was a kid and um and then I started thinking about it I was like where wait though do they exist in nature like is fluorescent color natural or did humans invent it and I like had I did this like deep dive of like my quest to discover the origin of fluorescence and the answer is like a little bit of both it's yes there is fluorescence naturally in nature there are animals that have fluorescent stripes and things um, you know, usually to like scare off predators, but the actual like ability for humans to like make those colors that really came about in the 20th century, that that really came about from like a new understanding of color that was unlocked by electricity. And I think that is like way cool. Like, I think that's like, this is what I mean by it. It almost feels like a privilege to get to be in this cohort of people like pioneering the internet, we also get to be, we're pretty relatively new to certain colors and certain ways of expressing ourselves through color. And so I I, I take great zeal and great delight in, in like painting with these colors that are just new and exciting. I think, I think that's, that's a good word, like new, um, because there is like this sense of, traveling back in time I feel like there's like this sense of when you're talking about using the equipment it's like um you are in possession of ancient materials that you're able to manipulate right but the result is kind of so futuristic it's, it's wild it's like it really travels from the ancient to the future really really quickly and I think that color helps with that even though like you say you know when when the CRT TV you know came out and we would start experiencing these colors, right? Um, it might remind us of that time. It still has uh, this feeling of the future in it with its colors. I think I think that's that's something that's very powerful and, and palpable in the work. Thank you. Um, you know, one thing I, I was curious about was how you envision your work being displayed. Like let's say collectors showing work and they you just want to give some input. How would you how would you deal with that? 
I love the question of display and I'm always excited when artists get asked because we have a lot of thoughts about it. I have a lot of thoughts about how my work is best displayed. And the, the exciting part of the answer is that my art is multifarious. It is like intended to be displayed in many different ways. And it's, it's almost hard to display it wrong. Um, and what I mean by that is, uh, you know, the fact that I'm working with vintage medium, I'm working with VHS tapes, which are the last analog medium last analog visual medium because what came next was DVDs and that was an early form of digital medium. And so uh, I think a lot about that, how my work with the VHS, my work with like recording screens and side screens, my work has a virtual physicality to it. Um, and in a way, in fact, that I think encourages pushing it in display. And by that, I mean that a lot of my work, I'd say the majority of my work is 4-3 ratio, aspect ratio, which is the aspect ratio of CRT television. So in that sense, it actually can be very straightforward. It looks fantastic on a 4-3 CRT television. And um, I actually take great joy in uh, consulting with collectors um, and I actually have a number of different frameworks that I'm working on of how I can uh, help collectors with display because the beauty of the work is that it can be shown at many different sizes and the different sizes kind of create a different experience. And I, as the artist, actually welcome that multidimensionality to it. Um, depending on a collector space, what might be most appropriate is a very small CRT television. And I think that's great. If you have the space, you might want a very large one. I think that's great as well. Um, but I also think my work, I, I often point out to people, if I wanted it to only stay on CRT televisions, I wouldn't be making it as NFTs. I wouldn't be making it as uh, digital art there would I would I would go with some framework that's more in line with how we've traditionally treated video art that I actually think my work in many ways I think of it like it's like painting with light uh, on videotape or sculpting with light on videotape and because light is such an essential component of what I'm doing I think it actually works really well with projection um, I used to curate a, a show here in Los Angeles called Prism Pipe that was kind of all about that, about how projecting work is different than showing it on a screen. And it brings new qualities out. And with my work specifically, a lot of the little sculptural aspects I'm getting with the light really shine, pun intended, uh, when projected. And so, you know, in it, in like my ideal scenario, and, and maybe I'll get there sooner than later, I'd love for the work to be shown like in museum galleries. Like, you know, they have those dark rooms you can go in. It looks excellent, blown up the size of a wall. I think when people are able to get in and see the actual texture, um, whether I, you know, I have different ways I'm creating the work, whether it's the texture of the videotape or the texture of the CRT screen itself, um, it's allowing them to have a more tactile experience with it when the work is is shown in a really large setting. But that being said, I also am someone who got my start and came up creating my work to share on the internet. So it also is completely um, intended for and optimized for viewing on a phone screen, viewing on a laptop screen. Like it's, I don't view it as, uh, in any way, shape, or form being um, demeaned by being shown on a very small screen. Um, there's, you know, often what happens now, I think, with NFTs is we're sort of waiting for display tech to catch up because there's no one aspect ratio for digital art. And TVs, just the production line, the supply chain we have for TVs has created all TVs in 16.9 which is from cinema, you know, cinema was always done in 16.9, nine, 
because they wanted to show off these expensive sets they were building. So they, you know, filmed it in widescreen. And so I think as we see digital art become more and more prevalent, we're, we're hopefully, and I think we already are seeing screens that are one, one, you know, seeing screens that are maybe different aspect ratios. And um, we're in this kind of like fun moment that where I think that the technology makers and the artists get to be in dialogue around the fact that artists should not I do not feel artists should create art uh, to fit the tech I feel the tech should adapt to fit the art I see that because you know looking at the artworks on a platform they're not like they're not even full screen initially you're seeing them at a small size so you may or may not be making a snap judgment based on it at a smaller size but then you have this other layer of excitement you know, you mentioning like a larger TV if you have the space to view it there because it can really take over a room, right? Like depending on how big this TV is, or it could be a sort of like something like corn that beckons you to, to adventure with it, you know? Uh, so, so it allows the collector a lot of playfulness in that as well, how they want to present it. And that, that goes back to, you know, like play and your work is that it is very inviting and playful. And I think that's that's another thing that excited me. I wanted to sort of like end this off with more of a technical question. But this is this is about the Ethereum blockchain and how it sort of switched from um to proof of stake. You know what I mean? I, I want to discuss how that is actually a big deal for NFTs and how people will be uh, perceiving them. Ethereum, this major blockchain, went from being proof of work, which was this energy intensive system that everyone was losing their goddamn minds about. It went from that in a year and a half from proof of work to proof of stake, which has essentially cut its energy usage down to the point of being like marginal. Like it's it's eliminated every single one of those energy intensive rigs. They are no longer required that that change happened so fast to me is is one of the is one of the greatest sort of ideological um demonstrations of why blockchain is a future technology and is a technology of a humanity that is attempting to actually change and actually evolve and not just give lip service to the idea of change and the idea of evolution. Like it actually happened. It's still a little mind boggling that it actually happened. It has now been up and running for well over a month, running smoothly, working great. We all now get to continue doing this great NFT experiment and now know that our carbon footprint was reduced to like, I mean, just like by a huge exponential scale reduced to very little compared to what it was. Um, it's something that I would say to anyone, if anyone was letting the that aspect, which again, was the most valid critique of blockchain, if that was what was holding anyone back, that's not there any. It's gone now. It's It's like you no longer... Um, that should no longer be the concern. Uh, you know, of course, people have other ideological fears around NFTs and the virtualization of value. But um, if if the concern was was the carbon footprint, it, it's really something that um, whether you're into blockchain or not is something that can be celebrated. That this this energy intensive system was just completely overhauled into one that is now. Uh, future friendly. I feel like this is life. You know, you, 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 there's going to be people who don't agree with you, and um, you have to be able to take it. And I think that we're in a position where, you know, we know that you know um, Ethereum has moved to proof of stake, and we understand on a level that they may not. And um, just here for the art to enjoy it and to create it. Um, you don't have to put everything else on top of that. Just enjoy it for what it is. And so I'm very, I'm very happy um, still as a collector and in the direction that it's going. And I'm very confident that it's no longer a thing where you have to, you know, 
argue with someone. I don't even need to, to, to talk about it with them because how I found it, I believe other people like me will find it and they'll be enjoying it. And so I, I think time will do its thing. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for um, sitting down and giving me so much of your time. I There was so much I wanted to talk about and I think I got um, a great bit of that down. And so I feel really fulfilled from this talk. Thank you so much. Thank you. This was a delight. I'm so happy.